Um, welcome to this very special session of uh, European Centre Seminar. Um, I would like to simply share with you, um, uh, ask you to join me in our really, in this great moment, uh, for a book launch, a very special book launch, a book called Memories of Empire and Entry into International Societies, View from the European Periphery, which is edited by Philip Eshdus. And, um, and I want to say that it's wonderful for me to welcome you, Philip, here in Oxford. Um, uh, we met quite a while back, and, and I think his work is, is wonderful. Uh, Philip has been uh, a professor, assistant professor at the University of Belgrade, uh, and has now spent a year in Bristol as a visiting uh, fellow or visiting visitor, and uh, is going back or is whatever. We don't know yet what you're going to do next. But in this, in the next, in the last uh, few years, uh, Philip has done a lot of research uh, on the EU, EU foreign policy. Tomorrow he's, he's giving a talk on uh, EU missions. But today he's, we are really celebrating uh, the publication of this book, which he's been working on for four years, or at least the idea came up in, for the last four years. And it is a very special book. And it is a very important book to launch here in Oxford. In fact, it came out a few days ago. And when it circulates around the room, you can smell it's still very, very fresh uh, off the press. Um, the book is really a first. Uh, it's a book which is applying, uh, first of all, critiquing and thinking hard about, well, the English school. Now, I have to make a confession here, because when I first came to this uni great university in 99, I'd never really heard of the, Ox uh, the English school. I vaguely, oh. I know, no, I know, Richard, <laughs> how could that be? Had you heard of, you had heard of the English school. <laughs> and we're not going to compare notes. But it, I, indeed, I was in the United States, and I, you know, it, it didn't exist there. Whereas, of course, it is the school that, Somehow, when you come here, you understand that it's a way of understanding uh, international relations that, A, is wonderfully uh, historical, goes back in history, uh, and B, thinks really, really hard about how the, the, the evolution of the international system. We're going to talk a lot about this. So, wow, you're in Oxford and you, you, un you wonder, how is it that the world doesn't know more and the world of IR in the US hasn't internalized more the the kind of subtlety of the school standing somewhere between realism and institutionalism and constructivism, that having kind of foresown everything in advance that happened in the field. But then you stand back and you think, hmm, but there are problems with the English school. And part of the problem is something we've talked a lot about in this room, you know, the Eurocentric aspect of the English school. And the idea that somehow Europeans were so great to come up with the system that then little by little they the whole world embrace, while at the same time, really, in their study, denying the agency of that rest of the world that was supposed to embrace the system. So indeed, both understanding what this way of looking at the world and, its hist and the history of international affairs and critiquing it is, is really the agenda that you set yourself uh, when you started this project, Philip. And uh, indeed, um, uh, in addition, how are you going to do that? Well, you had a special interest in Southeast Europe and in, in, in Eastern Europe, and the book applies uh, the insights and the critique of the English school to Central and Eastern Europe. So this is why this talk is co-sponsored between the European Center, CSOX, and the Center for International Studies, uh, in that it looks specifically at the region of the world that many of us in this room have, are especially interested in. So the way we're going to do this today, uh, because it's a book launch, Philip is not going to make a long presentation. He's going to present the book in a few minutes, uh, just to give people in the room who haven't yet had time to read it uh, a sense of what's in it. But I want to say that we do have a PDF for people who are interested in reading more and haven't received the PDF yet. Uh, and then afterwards, we will have three wonderful discussants. Um, and Philip, I was going to um, I was going to cite to also cite the fact that um, this is your third edited book. You have written two previous books before that I simply wanted to mention. 
violent extremism in the Western Balkans and a lesson learned in security sector reform in Euro-Atlantic integration in Serbia and Slovakia. Uh, just to say that you deal with topics that are very important also to the CSOC's agenda. Now, uh, so to discuss the book, we are going to um, turn, uh, first of all, I mean, we haven't yet even discussed no, in which order we want to, to speak, but perhaps Josa Musli uh, will speak first, because A ladies first and non-Oxford uh, guests first. Uh, Josa has come to us from Brussels, where she's doing a postdoc post at the Free University, of Brussels, uh, so comment for a few minutes um, after Philip, and then uh, Richard, our very own Richard Kaplan, and Jan Zilanka, uh, who do not need further introduction, either of them. Um, but I think the rule here is that because it's a book launch, we want to make it as dynamic as we can. So your comment, Philip will then respond to your comments, but and your comments can be as short as you want them to be, <laughs> but not as long as you want them to be. So this is the order of things today. And uh, without further ado, uh, let me turn to you, Philip, and thanking you for visiting us and, and giving us the honor of being the first ones to see the product. So congratulations, and uh, please tell us what is the main point of the book. Thank you, Philip. So uh, it's a really a great honor to present my book uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, thank you for this wonderful introduction as well. I think that there couldn't be a better place to present uh, this book than, than here at the University of Oxford uh, today. And um, let me start my short introduction uh, with, with an anecdote. Um, when Calypso invited me to talk at the University of Oxford, she also told me that uh, we will have a high table after the, the, the discussion. And uh, I immediately assumed that uh, for the purpose of the lecture, I will have um, informal clothing and also for the purpose of the dinner, because this is how we do it in Serbia. So I drew upon my memories of how we do things in Serbia to make sense of what is expected from me here today. Of course, I was wrong. And uh, at the high table, people my are... Fault. No, it's, it's also my fault because I jumped into a conclusion. And I didn't bring a tie. So I made a misstep uh, because I drew on my memories from, from Serbia. And this is exactly what this book is all about. It's about, uh, how, about the way small states who are entering international society in history, they, some started in the early 19th century, some are uh, starting their entry uh, more recently, but they all make certain conclusions about what the expectations are within the international society based on their previous historical experiences and memories. And their memories and experiences are linked not to the sovereign state system, but to the suzerain state system, to the empires that they're breaking free from, either the Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, or even empires which are uh, way further in the past, like the memories from, from uh, long bygone empires, such as the Byzantine Empire. And in this particular book, we looked at the role of memories for the entry or the expansion of international society. And we looked at the region of the world which has so far been totally overlooked by the English school theorists, which is the Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Now, the reason why English school theorists um, have um, neglected this part of the world is, in my view, um, simply because this part of the world is neither considered to be fully European nor fully non-European. And the English school is interested in how European state system is expanding to non-European areas. So somehow I think that they um, assumed that um, Eastern Europe was part of the European state system from the very beginning, which is, as we show in this book, not really the case. There is a whole set of states that we look in this book and uh, some um, um, broke free from the Ottoman Empire, the others from the Russian Empire, and Slovakia um, from, from the Habsburg Empire. And we look at Bulgaria, Belarus, Greece, Poland, Romania, Serbia, and Slovakia. And we show how nation builders in those seven states relied on memories of suzerainty of empires um, to make sense of international society 
what kind of expectations um, they thought the European Society of States will have of them, and um, in, to what degree this, those memories helped them to join the, the International Society, but also to what extent those memories complicated their entry and are still complicated their entry into international society until this day. And we make four broad conclusions. I will not go into detail now. Uh, we'll have more time to discuss these conclusions um, in the Q&A session. But I will just briefly tell you what, what the key uh, insights we came to in, in the book. The first is insight is that all nation builders in uh, the countries concerned activated memories of um, empires they were breaking free from, but also some uh, more distant empires that they thought as their golden age and uh, the times when they reigned supreme in history, um, to stake their claims vis-a-vis -vis the international society, to show that they're not from yesterday, that they've been there for a very long time, and that uh, therefore they should be granted a special status either in their regions or more widely. Uh, but also those memories that they activated uh, as um, they entered, as I mentioned previously, complicated um, their entry in various ways. One example, for instance, is Serbia. This is my chapter. Uh, and in, in the case of Serbia, Serbian nation builders in the early 19th century wanted to um, rebuild or recreate uh, the Dushan's empire from the 14th century. Um, that was the first, uh, first idea. Yes, we are coming into existence, therefore we should stop where our ancestor, we should continue where our ancestor stops in the early 14th century, uh, which is rebuild the empire. And this memory complicated Serbia's so socialization with international society, and the Kosovo myth, which is the last remnant of this uh, memory, is still complicating Serbia's uh, relationships with, with the European society of states. The second um, key insight um, that we make or that we reached in this book is that um, those memories of empires were constitutive of um, identities of these states. So those memories uh, were used to draw uh, borders or boundaries between who we are and who our uh, neighbors or between us and them. And not only spatially and externally, but also internally and temporally. Uh, so memories of empire were not only used to distinguish the Serbia and Greece from Turkey or Russia, but also to distinguish within those polities those who were modernists from those who were seen as, uh, as maybe more uh, oriental or conservative and uh, in a way um, um, retrograde. The third insight that we make um, in this book is that memories that were activated um, during the process of the, during this long process of entry into international society of these states um, is that um, those memories helped a state in uh, consideration to understand the international society and to, 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 to make sense of what is expected from them once they join the European family of states. And um, here we drew uh, largely on the work of Ivor Neumann and his uh, article in <coughs> Review of International Studies, where he um, basically argues that states leaving the Caesarean systems think of international politics as uh, positioning oneself in the center of the system, not accepting um, the fact that this is a anarchical system where there is a sovereign equality among member states, but rather they see international politics in hierarchical terms. So Serbia, for instance, when it um, um, started its entry, long entry into international society, uh, immediately thought that the whole point of international politics is to position yourself at the center of some regional or mini-regional um, South Slavic order. Of course, later on, Serbian nation builders synchronized this memory and um, translated it to the language that was uh, at the time dominant in international society, the language after the spring of nation of self-determination, of uh, sovereignty, of nationalism, so on and so forth. And therefore, the idea of recreating the Dushan's empire was translated into the idea of Yugoslavia. 
And fourth, and this, with this I will finish, uh, we argue in the book that memories were uh, politically contested and unstable. Um, they were constantly being negotiated and synchronized with uh, the realities of the time and with um, the expectations from the international society. This synchronization hasn't fully finished and many of those states still um, struggle to um, somehow align their historical memories with expectations from the international society and this is uh, the final part of each and every chapter. So the whole story is extending all the way up to the EU and NATO uh, enlargement debates in those countries. For the future we have a plan to um, make a sequel to this book and to discuss memories of greatness in uh, the core states of international society and how um, both in the United States and uh, in Britain but in other countries memories of greatness are being um, tightly connected to status anxiety uh, in states with America, let's make America great again, but also in Britain with the idea of global Britain. In Japan we have also the resurgence of the, dis of the discourse on um, past uh, greatness. And um, I hope that we're going to extend this logic and to uh, produce the second book in a few years' time. With this I will finish and I'm looking forward to uh, comments from the panel and from the audience. Thank you, Philip, because it's really a feat to summarize all the subtle points uh, in, in, in nine minutes. And uh, let, let me simply add that I think it, for everyone listening, it's, it's already clear that, you know, in a way your book does things second degree from what something we, you know, we, we did this book, Echoes of Empire, here, and which was very much the memory of empire. Whereas, and in fact, your book is a second degree to that because it asks to what extent and how actors strategically use the me memories to invent and reinvent themselves, position themselves vis-à-vis -vis each other. So you're taking you know, an agenda that is incipient, uh, totally under research still, but really critical, and in the book pushing it, and then now, now pushing it one step further. And, and this is really hugely innovative, and uh, I'm looking forward now to hearing everybody's comments, starting from your side. Thank you. Uh, well, congrats, uh, first of all, for the for the uh, edited volume and for bringing to the fore yet again another topical discussion that, well, ironically enough, as, as I was reading it, I see that uh, the authors, along with you, spent a great deal situating the field and tackling the Eurocentrism in which the field operates as such, be that with the English school in particular, also with the international society, the contours uh, of international society uh, more generally, which I think speaks still volumes about the way how knowledge production in IR and political science at large still uh, operates. Um, my work largely concentrates on EU missions and interventions abroad, uh, and in particular how uh, the EU creates its others, uh, be that within Europe or outside Europe. This also goes along with uh, Philip's previous work, other than this book. So a lot of my reflections on this volume are actually quite tied with your previous work and also what I currently uh, work on. If I could just take the time to uh, give a couple of comments on uh, several issues that I thought were uh, thought-provoking and something that I look forward to discuss more closely. is the... Uh, Appalling similarity between uh, international society and Europeanization, or Europeanization if we, extend, if we understand it both as an ideological project and as a political project, and how narratives and how tropes of belonging, of not belonging, of being outside or within are very much similarly uh, reproduced in both of these uh, Account. So if, if this were to be an edited volume on narratives and memories of countries throughout their Europeanization process, it would have largely, again, uh, given a very similar account of what it means to belong or not to belong, or how these memories justify themselves, how they are reproduced throughout space and, uh, and time, both internationally, so how these small countries or countries coming from these liminal peripheries are perceived, 
but also how these narratives play out within uh, and inside these particular countries uh, specifically. Uh, how also uh, ceasing to be something, so ceasing to be Balkans or ceasing to come from an Ottoman heritage, uh, ceasing to become an other is essentially linked also with becoming part of this international society, much like it is linked with becoming part of Europe. Uh, a lot of public discourse in Croatia nowadays tries to avoid any uh, resonance with being part of the Balkans or even former Yugoslavia and being European, so suddenly more European than Bosnia and Herzegovina, or suddenly more European than the rest of the Balkans who did not manage to leave the club of otherness. They are still bounded to the group, uh, to the group of the uh, Balkans. Um, and this is not just in the in terms of the political project, but also in the in the academic uh, production uh, production as such. Uh, the second item that uh, I thought was very uh, relevant also in this regard is that much like the process of uh, Europeanization, the international society also sees uh, seems to be confined to a club of uh, welcoming modern states, so modern structures only. Uh, and I, I, I still feel a bit lost in the, in the discussion, how do we negotiate any scenarios of post-sovereignty or a post-sovereign society in this regard, beyond statism, beyond but the Westphalian uh, rules of the, of the game. And more importantly, uh, if I am to put this in a, in a form of a question, what does this statism, if, if I may, what does it say about the political imagination within the international society uh, as such? I'll leave it here, but I have other questions thank and you, comments. Thank you, Yosa, and also back. thank you for Thanks. encouraging us to, to connect these discussions to European enlargement, to current issues of European <coughs> enlargement with this competition between uh, Southeast European states of who is mm -hmm. more European, and yet of resentment too, for having mm -hmm. even to think that way or argue that way. It's a very mm -hmm. and, and the book, in fact, uh, has one of its great points is, is, is indeed to stress the historicity of, mm -hmm. the, of the enlargement process in, 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 in the way it's linked with um, contested memory. So this will be part of our conversation indeed. Richard. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to read the book, read the bits of that I was able to, to read. I haven't read all all the chapters, but I've read quite a, quite a bit, and I thought it was really fascinating. I really enjoyed, um, very very rich, rich um, analytically, um, philosophically, historically. I really enjoyed every bit of it that I that I read, and um, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, there's a lot going on in the book, um, things which I hadn't really taken into consideration and one one thing maybe a few things I wanted to, to um, press you on a little bit I was um, it's the relationship between the symbolic and the instrumental in part which I found also interesting and Ivor <coughs> raises this a little bit in his introduction and suggests in fact that there's a conflation not going on in the book necessarily, but uh, with scholars, Weber, others, um, maybe necessarily. But by, by that I mean, uh, is this about the construction of identities because that's what uh, elites in particular often do at critical junctures in, in history? Um, or is it about gaining entry? This is to international society, or if you want now to, to Europe to extend a little bit the framework. It's framed in the latter, although there's recognition, I think, in the, in the accounts of, of more than uh, an instrumental logic that is uh, that's going on um, and 
related to that, I guess, is, um, I mean, all histories are selective histories. And if the selection is motivated by instrumentality, then that provides a, a, a certain window on way of understanding what is how we get the outcome that we get. And you see that to some extent in some of the the pieces, some of the chapters in Romania, for instance, a determination to uh, appear uh, to, to, let's say, mitigate the differences that there might appear to be between this distant country and people under the Ottomans. It's the otherness that gets um, eliminated, stressing the common uh, Roman, i.e. European roots of civilization, um, stressing the in case of Romania again, the Latinness with an expectation that that especially will appeal to the French, and then seeing the French as patrons of this project, if you will, supporters of this project. All of that is very clearly uh, instrumental, um, but um, as I think was just alluded to, there there are different audiences. So there is the external audience, uh, the community of states, a society which these aspiring states or entities wish to be a part of. But there is also a domestic debate going on. And I guess one question I would have is, is whether they are perfectly parallel. In other words, are you doing battle at home domestically, let's say the modernizers against the traditionalists, with an idea of uh, achieving a certain outcome uh, beyond your own borders in terms of entry into international society? Or are there other tensions that are taking place? I mean, modernization isn't only about entry into international society. I mean, maybe <coughs> there are other aspects of, of modernization, and the battle is being waged for other purposes beyond the one that is, uh, gets the attention, the primary attention, in this volume. So I'd be interested to know a little bit about more about about that, um, and um, also comes to mind um, the, yeah, I suppose, I mean, I think about, when I think about memory, this, again, going back maybe to a point I said earlier about the extent to which th this is um, active and not um, uh, almost subconscious. In other words, are there, uh, I, I think about this quote, I think Faulkner opens Light in August with this wonderfully ambiguous quote of memory believes before knowing remembers. And this kind of tension between memory and in this case knowledge, but you could say history. So the idea of uh, m memory, history being something that's deliberately constructed, all histories are of course, but memory almost being something often which we um, don't choose. I mean, we don't choose our memories in many respects. We are in some ways afflicted by them. <coughs> They reside with us, but they, and in some ways, for that reason, they become almost um, unavoidable. You can't root out a memory, good or bad, but you can rewrite a history. Um, so I wonder about this to a degree also, how much is this about memories that are residual, they're just almost an organic part of society and how much is this about histories that are being written that are more malleable to some extent and then if it's not necessarily either or because 
it's a little bit of both. So if that's not too um, elliptical, I might just leave it. <laughs> Some thoughts with you uh, there. But I really, I found it really, really um, interesting. Uh, and although, as I said, this is about entry into international society more broadly, I was also thinking about how this applies a lot to accession to the EU um, as well. I mean, many of the same, I think, uh, patterns, if you will, and, um, are relevant, I think. So, just some errant thoughts. Well, well thank you. And, and as, a, as a kind of footnote, listening to you, Richard, I, um, and you're, what you, connecting what you said about eliminating otherness and the negotiation of memory or trying to forget, I mean, perhaps one way to encapsulate this is, isn't there a tension that's brought out in the book between memories of greatness, invented greatness, and memories of sameness, mm -hmm. that somehow you need both? And so it's your, your appeal to the distant past is kind of a difficult thing, because it's often this memory of greatness or invented greatness, but then it's quite different. So how but do you... But also, even going further, and this I thought was really interesting, weakness... So again, the Romania chapter, we need, you know, we think of the, the, the civilizing mission as a critique, I mean, um, from our standpoint today, but it, it is also um, employed, in, in, at least in this particular case, as um, another reason why we need to be in international societies, because we need the benefits. It's not just that we're... Um, eligible for, we, we've, uh, we've, we've demonstrated our bona fides, we are, we are like you, but we aspire to be and have the potential to be, but are not yet like you. Please help us. Yeah, we need you. So we partly the conversation is also about when there are these very different, slightly quite contradictory uh, fabric of the memory, are they, do they belong to different camps in the country or cross country? Are they held by the same actors? Uh, how are they negotiated uh, mm -hmm. be, since they can be contradictory? Are there strategies of accommodation between these memories of greatness and weakness and sameness? You know, how, do you, how do you accommodate these different memories? Or do you need to accommodate? Maybe that's the whole point that you're making is that no, they're contradictory memory and that's kind of why it's not so simple as the founding fathers of the English school wanted us to believe. You know, so partly your book is it's more complicated, guys. <laughs> so maybe that works for that. Jan. When empire. Have you ever written about empire? Do you know anything <laughs> about empire? Mean anything to you, Jan? <laughs> Rings a bell. Rings a bell. When Calypso asked us to be as short as possible, I was thinking about famous quote from President Yeltsin. Mr. President, could you summarize situation in Russia in one word? Good, answered Yeltsin. Maybe in two words, President. No good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. So I like very much the book, like like Richard. I, In one word, don't I give us the two words. <laughs> but then, if I have to describe it in two words or three, <laughs> my major problem is that you fall yourself into the imperial entrapment, but not geopolitical, but academic, because. You try to find yourself of, on, on the imperial map of Western theories of international relations, and you found this English school. <coughs> but I wonder really whether there is justification for this. Because if English school is famous of anything, it is not empire nor memory. Hmm? Uh, what Martin Wright has done, in, in my view, precursor of the school, was to, to, to explore philosophical traditions and apply them to international relations. What Adam Watson and, uh, and uh, Handley Bull has done was more global, and I would read it, if it was about empire, it was about how to find the role 
for Britain in the, on the global map after empire. I think Busan and company we can skip <laughs> because actually the most interesting that kind of research has been done not from English but from Scandinavians. Ole Weber and Ivor Neumann, yeah? Yeah. who have been associated with the LSE somehow, but but not really fully fledged part. Um, but 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 Boson about empires. He was interested in superpowers, states, you know, uh, and 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 this is. Actually, he never acknowledged what actually the precursor of English schools has done. That there is, you know, that there are other units than states really. And and what is interesting about empires? And here I refer specifically specifically to your book that the border between the periphery and the metropolis is very fuzzy, and it's not one-way street. That the periphery sucks in the metropolis and its internal discourse problems, and and you at certain time really do not know who is really really here earning money, who is deciding about various things because because the peripheries are very <coughs> important part for the metropolis to justify its own existence and civilization meeting uh, mission is part of this you have to justify it sacrifices in terms of uh, resources and manpower and, and so on. and of course authors of civilization mission would always tell you it's better to go to, to these countries to helping them to become like us rather than to abandon them, right? If, if you look at the discourse between be, when, when particularly the discourse around the Tocqueville letters, not from America, but from Algiers, you know, when the Tocqueville went to North Africa and, and argued in French Parliament when he returned that, that, that uh, Algiers can be like Cincinnati had they be given opportunity. He was criticized by, by realists or conservatives that this is impossible. They will never be like us, whatever investments. Yeah. So... So, so here it's important to understand that, and I think you, your book gets it very well, is that periphery is a very important par part of empire. And in fact, a lot of ideas about what empire is come from periphery. There might have been discrepancy of power, but there is certainly not a um, you know kind of clear asymmetry of relationship and and I think your book shows it very well and I think your book shows also very well that a lot of schools of international relations just miss what is going on particularly in this case in European politics uh, and um, and that, that you really have to be narrow-minded realist, only looking at some numbers, not to see how much periphery shapes the notion of empire. And in Europe, it's now it's very clear, but this is not always like this. Yeah? And the differences which you pointed out between part of the Balkans and the other parts which basically are fully integrated and don't even want to be called as Balkan, show you how those discourses may diverge and, and, and how <coughs> the search for alternatives can be a dead street. 
Serbia is a very good example for you, right? But not only Serbia. I think I've I ex I exploited my time <laughs> more than I should. You but I will jump in later. You were perfectly succinct and a very clear point. I can't resist, as a French person, just purely amending your point about Tocqueville, because maybe you make him look a bit too good. In fact, he, when he made these speeches coming back from Algeria, he, he was trying to justify the pogroms and the burning of villages. Yeah, eventually they will attain civilization, but he was part of that discourse, strangely enough, which is really not strangely enough, because it's always the story of double standards for us and for them. Uh, but it was in the later thing. Then he was, you know, when he convinced French to really invest in, then he was went back as a civil servant, and then he came back totally disillusioned because of what you said, that all this thing happened which he didn't advocate. But initially, when he went, uh, uh, the, uh, the story was 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 totally different. But you are absolutely right; it proved to be totally. But he didn't sign with this. He said, "This is not what I wanted to recommend." But look, read the letters of uh, from Argus. They, they they are not justifying pogroms. It has happened. We know this. Hmm? Yeah. Later. No, it's 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 a complicated. And way. you can say he was naive, but. Uh, and 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 the one other thing before I turn the floor to you to address some of them, whichever ones you want. I mean, you don't have to address me this everything. But I just want to clarify for for those of you who haven't yet uh, have the chance to read the book that when we speak about empire in the book, we do it in at least uh, when we read it. I mean, we do it. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, uh, anyway. There's at least three ways in which empires come in, right? There is the kind of Jan Zilonka way that there's Europe as empire uh, and, and, these, and Southeast Europe being, or East Europe being the uh, periphery of that empire, as Jan was just discussing, but also the echo within that of the, nation, the member states as, as empires of the past being part of the EU and what that funny conflation means. Uh, in the EU reproducing or not some of what its own nation states were before versus you, that's one kind of empire story there's a sec separate empire story which is obviously the empire that most of the, all of these countries the empires most of these countries were part of Ottoman, Habsburg, Russian uh, and the very complex memories of aggrandizement and victimization that these involved and then you sometimes, in some cases, as we were saying, the distant empires, the empires they themselves were at the center of suzerain, or so sometimes they were the object of suzerain em empires that somehow controlled them, and sometimes they themselves, they have also a more distant memory of their own kind of made at home empire. So I, I just wanted to clarify because the word empire is used in so many different ways in this book, which is part of its richness. And now back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for um, fascinating comments and um, a lot of um, uh, very interesting and difficult questions. I obviously don't have the time to respond to them all, but I picked uh, three key themes um, which um, I think um, are at this moment um, worth um, responding to. And I will abide to the old Chinese proverb which says if you have to swallow uh, two frogs. First, swallow the biggest one, and I will start with Jan's. Uh, I thought it was a comment. French saying. Okay. Since we love to eat frogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you very much for 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 your um, intervention, and um, I couldn't agree more uh, with you that um, there are serious uh, problems with the English school account of uh, the expansion of international society. Um, and one of them being that they focus on states and they focus on European states and uh, they don't take into account neither the empire nor the non-Western world that much. And this criticism has been um, made very well by, by a number of authors, uh, some of them teaching here at the University of Oxford. Uh, but um, I also think that if our biggest weakness can be narrowed down to the problems that the English school theories have made, we have done a very good job. So thank you very much. If this is the only problem 
um, of our book, I think, um, and if we didn't contribute to the confusion, that's already a success. Um, what we tried in the book is actually to redress some of the problems that English school uh, accounts, some of the problems which, are, which has been uh, built into the narrative um, of expansion in the Bull and Watson book and also some other accounts, uh, which basically neglected, as Calypso said, the agency of the entrants. Uh, their approach, in a way, assumes that the states which are joining the international society are states without, or polities without history, in a way. That they come as a blank slate uh, when they socialize with the European society of states. Um, and we try to exactly um, oppose such a view and show that those polities are not polities without history that those polities have very rich um, histories and that those histories are closely intertwined with how they socialize with the international society and what, what they make of this encounter. So uh, I, I, I don't know to what extent we, we managed to redress this problem, but that was um, exactly one of those goals. And the, the memories that those polities have are all, by definition, memories of empire because there, is, there has been only one Westphalian uh, anarchic society of states, and this is the European one, which started to uh, develop in the 16th, 17th century Europe and then went on to envelop the world. And this uh, leads me to the second theme, which is the theme of Eurocentrism. Um, now I will draw on um, the defense that the English school theorists um, have used to defend their Eurocentrism, and uh, this is the fact that um, it's not that the English school account of um, the expansion is Eurocentric. It's that the historical process itself has been quite Eurocentric from the, from the beginning. So um, it, was the, it, it was the Westphalian system which, uh, whose nucleus started in Europe and then simply diffused um, globally. So the process has been Eurocentric and therefore, to an extent, the narrative and the story about the <coughs> process also has to be uh, at least partially Eurocentric, although we try to, um, to kind of uh, redress, as I said in my previous comments, uh, by showing that how small states and states that uh, have been joining the, the society of states brought their narratives and histories of uh, suzerainty with them. And um, to a large extent, the, these stories are have been complicating this entry up until today. Uh, also, there was another way, um, another um, kind of um, um, idea behind this book um, to, to, to um, take on the Eurocentrism in IR knowledge production, and that is to invite people who are natives of those countries to write, uh, to write actually chapters. So we have um, a Bulgarian who wrote a chapter on Bulgaria, Belarusian on Belarus. So we drew really extensively on, um, on um, sources in those languages, and we tried to uh, overcome something that is really, really common in IR, uh, where uh, people write about other countries and they don't speak the languages and they, they haven't, done signi they haven't uh, spent significant time uh, in those countries. So m I, at least um, to an extent, I hope that we manage to overcome this, uh, this, bi um, this bias. Uh, now, uh, lastly, I would like to address the uh, comment by Professor Kaplan uh, about uh, symbolic versus instrumental action. I think this is, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, I didn't uh, decide to discuss it at the very end because it's the easiest question. question. On the contrary, uh, it's, it's also extremely difficult and, um, and complex issue that we didn't um, address properly in the book. We, we haven't... We, we have, our point of departure was basically the variant that every action is at the same time uh, strategic and symbolic. And that this distinction between you know, logic of consequences and logic of um, appropriateness is to a, to a large extent um, a false dichotomy. Every action has um, you know, elements of both. Now we didn't address the question to what extent 
um, the, the, the memories were strategically utilized and to what extent they were organically embedded within those polities and that the, the nation builders didn't have a choice. Um, my hunch is that um, it, it's, it's, we left it to a large extent to, um, it, it, we, we treated this question as an empirical question, not as a theoretical question. So we let the empirical investigation in each and every chapter um, kind of, um, dig out uh, strategic and symbolic elements in um, the memories that were activated. For instance, I will discuss very briefly about Serbia because this case um, was written by me and I know it best. Um, the memory of Dusan's empire was um, enshrined <coughs> and uh, written in a document called Nacertanije from 1844. And this document was secret for half a century. So the, so, so the, the memory of um, uh, Dusan's empire and the ambition to recreate uh, you know, the, the huge a Slavic Serb empire on the ashes of the Ottoman one was uh, to a large extent internal, private, and um, um, not directed to either external or domestic audiences, but something that the nation builders deeply held as a conviction in their mind. I'm not saying that this memory wasn't public in, in other documents, but uh, this was really the st like national strategy for over half a century of Serbia. It, uh, was le it leaked uh, many decades later, but for almost half a century, it was totally secret document sitting in the drawer of uh, decision makers. So this, in my empirical case at least, uh, hints at um, you know, the symbolic and very organic uh, interpretation of what, those, what this memory was, because it wasn't, wasn't it wasn't chosen as um, you know, a message to s certain audiences that will strategically uh, stake Serbia's claim for a position in international society. In other chapters, other authors have uh, come to maybe different conclusions, and I invite everyone in the audience to, to read and uh, make uh, their own conclusions on the basis of this. With this, uh, maybe I would like to stop and... Um, let the audience ask the question. Absolutely, and I'm sure our three discussants also might want to jump back, including on the English school and on the instrumental symbolic, but perhaps we'll open up and then you can kind of jump back in. Is that, is that okay? Fine. Yeah? Okay. Brilliant. So please introduce yourself. Um, Japrak. Yes, I'm Japrak Kuzla. I'm an academic visitor here um, at CISOC. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, since I haven't read the book, um, the question might be kind of obvious, um, but I was wondering, as, as I was listening to you, um, you were talking more about you know, um, how empire and memories of empire were used by the states themselves, and how did Europe react uh, to these constructions was uh, the question that uh, came to my mind. Related to that, how much of this was successful? You addressed this a little bit in the discussion. Um, since these tensions are still going on, uh, it wasn't necessarily perfectly successful, I guess, in convincing uh, Europe that these states belonged to the European society. And another question, like coming from Turkey, we always, we always have the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish example in mind. Um, so I was wondering how the Ottomans uh, at the time reacted to this type of construction. I'm probably asking you too many questions that you might not be able to answer, <laughs> since this wasn't necessarily the focus of the book, but if you have insights uh, based on your research in answering these questions, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shall we pick maybe a few, or if there is any? Uh, okay. uh, it's a big question, so maybe yeah. you address it now. Because <laughs> it <laughs> it's is. like you, we giving agency to Europe, as it were. You wanting to take it away, yeah. it put it in the periphery, but now Yaprak is saying, well, what about the no, rea Europe's to reaction to that yeah. agency? <laughs> Not necessarily Europe. <laughs> Absolutely. But why periphery is not Europe? The core. I think you mean the core. Europe. When you say Europe's reaction, you mean the core. The states. core. Yeah. But also the other periphery. I mean the other, basically. I mean they were trying to. I'm um, also asked the question through the perspective of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So there were two questions. Like how did the Ottomans react? The other, basically. Ah. The other react to the the other 
and being constructive as the other. Thank you so much for uh, pushing me to think in that direction because that was, uh, as Calypso has mentioned, not uh, in the focus if we did want to uh, to tilt back to the agency of the states. But uh, definitely we do discuss in the book um, the ways in which the European Society of States um, reacted to, um, to the activation of these memories. And in, in certain occasions, those memories synced very well with the expectations of uh, the European Society of States. Whenever, for instance, the Balkan country or Eastern European country uh, such as Romania, claimed that uh, their uh, roots are in the Roman Empire and that therefore they should be accepted uh, by the West as one of them, that was obviously seen as uh, welcoming. But in other cases, when those memories came with certain um, ideas of European society which uh, were disturbing for, from the point of view of the regional order, or um, bilateral or multilateral relationships, in those cases, uh, core states in European society um, were not really happy um, with, with, with those memories. And um, I mentioned in my, in my chapter <coughs> the memory of um, the Kosovo myth and the Dushan's empire. Um, Yanis Stivartis is mentioning the, uh, the Megali idea uh, in Greece and uh, its relationship with the memories of uh, um, the, the greatness of the past. I mean, those ideas which um, kind of um, inspired certain megalomaniac territorial aspirations at the expense of the uh, neighboring countries were not seen by the core states as, as welcoming. So it depends. Um, and this is why one of the key claims of the book is that memories of empire both eased the entry into international society and complicated it at the same time. And this is an important point. Um, when it comes to Turkey uh, and Ottoman Empire, we originally had a case on the Ottoman Empire <coughs> and its memories um, um, of greatness, or Turkey's memories of greatness, in a forum that we published in International Relations. And it's an excellent piece, which was uh, authored by Einar Wiegen. Uh, but we finally decided to uh, drop this, this case because um, we were advised by the reviewers of the book uh, that the, the Tur Turkey is one of those cases which was really well studied in the English school. Although th this particular article uh, brought many new things, we really wanted to shed light on, on novel ideas. And what Einer argues in his paper is that Turkey's basically um, socialization and engagement with the West can be seen as one long um, process of marching towards the West. The entire, um, at least, um, uh, Turkish uh, history from Ataturk and maybe even from the Young Turk Revolution can be seen as an attempt to um, find an East and therefore, and thus stake its claim to join the West. And it seems to me that uh, for Turkey, uh, at least in the, the 20th century, um, this whole orientalization of um, the Ottoman Empire didn't present such a, they, they didn't see it as badly as one would expect because they, they themselves also wanted to uh, other the, their Ottoman past and to kind of distinguish themselves from what they used to be in the past. So they were, in a way, aligned with those Balkan countries and Eastern European countries which uh, um, kind of, um, uh, came to existence on the ashes of Ottoman Empire. So that, that would be my kind of initial idea, but um, Einar didn't look at the, the, the Ottoman or Turkish reaction to uh, the memories in Eastern Europe, and uh, um, definitely there is a lot more to say on that. But isn't there also, I mean, from going back to the European side, a tension always between celebration and denial. So if you uh, denial because it, to the extent that states were the object of imperial imperialism from Europe, there there will be denial uh, because because um, Europe as empire today is so benign, virgin birth, it, all this imperial stuff before didn't exist. But at the same time. There can be celebration or, or, or remembering 
to the extent that we're redressing something. So isn't it the case that, you know, to take these Balkan states from their Ottoman yoke uh, the, for the EU is of useful memory, including for othering Turkey, but also for kind of saying, well, this is a his we're, we're writing a historical wrong. And there, there's, so there's this interesting kind of tension from the European point of view about recognizing or not these memories. Definitely, and I think um, it's extremely interesting um, how the EU, in its um, discourse of its global identity, denies its colonialism and colonial heritage at all. Uh, the EU, uh, like all other great powers, wannabes in the, in, in the EU's case, um, they all kind of um, rely on the memories of greatness to stake their claim to great powerhood, uh, but the EU is is strategically denying uh, its colonial history, uh, but rather relies on the memory of its own internal violence, war. This is what Olive Weaver uh, argues about the EU, and it, it's an extremely interesting argument how the EU is othering itself to uh, bring its identity into existence. But on the other hand, Olive Weaver um, he hasn't addressed the issue uh, of... Um, the silence of the EU on its colonial past and what is the role of this silence in building of the EU identity. But in, in, in this particular uh, region, the EU or the Western uh, empires um, were not, uh, I mean, came maybe too, quite late. So uh, maybe that, that's the reason why, why this issue is not, you know, it is denied by the EU, if I got your question right. Dan, did you want to uh, Just only to say that historians who always uh, studied memories, now a topic which is very hot within historical studies is absence. The things which were erased from memory or in one way or another and, and explaining why is it so. Yeah. And uh, this started in... Um, in the study of Holocaust in particular, but then developed into other fields. It's a, it's a very growing uh, trend in historical studies. The presence of absence. Yeah, why some, some topics were erased from memory very consciously. Um, Jesse, please introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm, I'm Jesse, I'm a deep student. <coughs> I actually was thinking along these lines because um, in sociological studies and historical studies, um, and it goes back to what Richard was also saying about the instrumentalism and these symbolic values, there's a distinction made between cultural memory and collective memory. And cultural memory is the instrumental memory that we are given by our educational systems and by the, the attempts to erase or forget our memories that we all, for example, experience in Central and Eastern Europe after 1989, when the memory of a different empire, communist empire, was um, tried to be erased from our memories as, as much as possible by renaming streets um, and things like that. Uh, and I was just wondering whether in the types of memories you are looking at, whether you see, and there is often tension between collective memories, and collective memory is the memory of a community, it's a memory of families, and so on. It's it's a lot to do with oral history and so on. Of course, it doesn't span as long, but you know we have literature that sometimes where the collective memory comes through. So I was wondering whether what you're looking at, whether you see any tension between the these two types of memories, where the cultural, which is, so to speak, the imposed memory upon us, clashes with the collective memory, which is basically what the bottom-up approach mm -hmm. to memory is speaking. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so let's take questions related to that theme. I mean, I have two, but maybe this one is related to this. Um, you, you seem to use, I haven't read the book, I'm only to read it at some point, but you seem to use uh, memory and myths like interchange, interchangeably, but they are very distinct you know, phenomena. And I'm just referring here to the work of Duncan Bell, where he makes, he talks about a myth case. So I was just wondering, you know, what kind of work do they do in, in your work, and, and whether you make a distinction? Maybe you can address the, these two questions, and perhaps Richard is going to want to jump in. Oh, related to this. Yes. yes. <laughs> Paul, please, Paul, introduce yourself.
Um, there seems to me there's possibly a dichotomy when, when you're nation building, you do go to a golden age or a successful period um, in order to um, create a kind of cast of mind. But that's not always progressive. That's not always positive. Um, you want to create a sense of nationalism, a sense of self-identity in order to build a nation. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to be too provocative, but you know, Serbia is, is, I can't think of a better example where the um, memories of the vote may be um, less than progressive. And I wondered if you could, could discuss this notion. I mean, there is, there are good, there are good, there's a good sense of nationalism. There's a good sense of learning from historical mistakes. But there can also be a, a kind of, I mean, the Brits are very guilty of this. We have a, a kind of imperial nostalgia. Um, uh, but, but, you know, in, in the wider community, maybe in the communities that, that Jesse was talking about, you know, there, there can be a wrong, a, a wrong understanding. I have a separate question, but it's not connected to. Okay, let's take this group and then we'll come back to the other question. I wish I had uh, all those qu heard all those questions before we wrote the book. That's the problem. Yeah, we should do book launches as the before, beginning at of the writing the beginning. Books. Yeah, yes. I think the, we should uh, reverse the order. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's burn this book. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so, uh, several questions. One is um, about the cultural versus um, collective memory. We do actually draw on uh, Maurice Halbach's uh, distinction between historical and collective memory um, in, in a number of chapters. And um, obviously what we are concerned here with is... Um, collective memory, it's the memory which is uh, politicized, uh, not the memory which is either personal or his like historical memory which doesn't have a political um, dimension to it. Uh, and we studied how this politicization of uh, history through collective memories uh, have uh, influenced the socialization of states with international society. Now, this really harks back to the question of between symbolic and um, instrumental and to what extent uh, nation builders were free to choose between different memories uh, uh, and to what extent they were bound to uh, use certain number of uh, historic memories to, to, to make sense of the world. And as I said, I mean, I'm really agnostic on that question and... Um, I mean, I, I really think that this is, at least in this book project, we, we left it for the um, empirical investigation. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question to an extent. Um, different question was uh, whether, I mean, some, some memories can be progressive or regressive and it's it's very difficult question because um, with the benefit of uh, hindsight, I can now say which memories were maybe not so progressive. But um, if we would put ourselves into the shoes of, um, um, you know, Ilya Garashanin or Minister of uh, Interior of uh, the you know, Kingdom of Serbia in the you know, 1800s, I don't think that um, from his po point of view, his memories were, um, you know, regressive, especially given the fact that at the time, um, to have a sovereign state of your own meant also to have an empire of your own and to also to have your um, territory that you wanted to expand and also to, uh, and also to kind of uh, maybe be even brutal towards the, the enemies of the state within and without. And Shogo Suzuki has demonstrated this well in the case of Japan, <coughs> how Jap Japanese uh, invasion of Manjuria and its uh, imperial um, actions in, in Asia were actually a function of Japan's socialization with international society. Um, so I think it would be easy to kind of fall into this maybe trap to think about this uh, things um, retroactively <coughs> to say which memories were maybe progressive or regressive, but we, I think we have to think from the point of view um, of the contemporaries. And from the point of view of contemporaries, those memories were um, um, to a great extent, uh, at least from their point of view, 
aligned with what, uh, th that's what they thought. They thought that this was expected from them uh, by the core states in international society, to have an empire of your own. What kind of state are you if you don't have your golden era and if you don't have um, an empire to take pride in? Sorry, my mom is calling me, <laughs> and I don't know how to... All is well. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I if I um, answered. There was another question about myths. About myths. Uh, myth, myth is definitely not uh, one of the concepts that we kind of juggle with. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not one of the central concepts. In certain uh, chapters, it is as the Serbian chapter. Uh, I, I don't I don't want to talk for the others, and this is not like the one of the framing um, concepts of the book. But in my particular case of Serbia, I think uh, myth of Kosovo is the result of um, this politicization of um, historic uh, memory. It's the result of um, a deliberate political action to construct certain memories for the purpose of engaging with international society, but also to expanding to its southeast. Let's not forget that the Kosovo myth was not there from time immemorial as the nation builders uh, would like to have it. It came into existence in the aftermath of the Congress of Berlin. Why? Because, I mean, throughout the 19th century, Serbia wanted to expand to Bosnia. If you read Nacertania and other strategic documents from the 1850s, 1860s, you see that they never mentioned Kosovo and South Serbia. They mentioned Bosnia, Bosnia, Bosnia. But only when uh, at the Congress of Berlin, Austro-Hungarian Empire put its um, hand on, on, on Bosnia, Serbia, in need of its own uh, backyard, in need of its own um, territorial kind of um, expansion, invented the myth of Kosovo, which basically came into existence after the Congress of Berlin. And this, this has been established by historians. For instance, Vidovdan uh, was not celebrated as uh, neither a political or religious uh, date uh, up until the 1870s. And Vidovdan is today tightly connected to the Kosovo myth. Uh, so th there's m many ways in which we can see that myth was produced um, for the political purpose. Now, whether that was an instrumental or a symbolic action, again, it's extremely difficult for me to um, kind of untangle and decipher. I would, I would have to. Uh, our work is mainly descriptive, not explanatory. Maybe that's the reason. If we would take it to the next level and try to maybe explain <laughs> action, then we would have to make um, you know a choice between different logics of action. But uh, at the time being, it, it, it's aimed to be only hopefully a thick description of um, events. So I, 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 I don't usually like a scription or saying you're from this place, so you must have an opinion on this place. But nevertheless, <laughs> uh, Josa is from Kosovo originally, so uh, I, you might have, have something to say. I have a very different question, although mm -hmm. it's not particularly related but, to Kosovo. OK, but did although, you want to comment on the yeah, Kosovo point? Yeah, yeah, no, not particularly on the Kosovo point, but okay. on the memories as such. But in the case of Serbia, all sorts of memories, myths, or whatever, they tie to Kosovo in one way or the other, so it's, it's unavoidable <laughs> in a way. Uh, I was, uh, while, while reading the, the chapters, like, I think I was sometimes overwhelmed with, um, with the way how, how certain memories are, in a way, presented almost as holistically, almost as, as something uninterrupted also throughout the chapters. Now, maybe that is also because in order to navigate the intricate complexities of these memories, you might also need some historical background as well, which I don't, I'm not equipped with. But in, if, if, if I'm to follow what David Campbell does in Meta Bosnia, so in a way of positing on, on meta memories, let's say, what would be, I was wondering, what would be the agents, so who speaks uh, on these narratives, who are the agents that, that articulate these sort of narratives? Because there might be different subjectivities involved. And of course, you cannot do any, everything in a book, but in that case, would that give us a slightly different picture? And other than the agents, there's also the temporal element, which I think as IR scholars, political scientists, we tend to 
you know, read everything retrospectively, but the myth of Kosovo included, and other myths, including the Cossacks in today's Ukraine, or the way how the Holy Roman Empire plays out in Romania has been materialized very differently in different historical periods. So when I say holistically, I also mean this, that it's presented as something that is somehow given as, as a linear sort of, uh, of a narrative. And last, but this is also a, uh, uh, an implicit uh, critique to what I do as well. So when, when, when treating the, the, the local, the periphery in a way as such as, as something separate, and I think it relates to Jan's comment about this blurred line between the core and the, per and the periphery as well. I really do wonder how much of these narratives are local, local. You know, periphery exists, however we define it, periphery exists by imbuing itself with a certain sense of, of, of centrality as such. You know, you have a Europe square, including in countries like Germany, Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, Tbilisi. Like, there is this notion of being the center of Europe as such. So, it, it, even in different times, there is this, this tendency of, of positioning the centrality of, of the peripheries. And in that way, a lot of what passes for local narratives is also very much core influenced in, in a way. So I don't know where this distinction is. Yeah, you have this beautiful, uh, you quote Einar Wiegen, who, who speaks about how countries are getting an East. So they mm. become, there's, how do you become the center? Because you create your own East in yeah, this yeah. moment. In, yeah. Who is Whether Kosovo's East, I wonder? Is it Turkey? <coughs> no, it's, it's Turkey now. Okay. Yeah. And you, you see that narrative also unfolding in other, this is also a, a different way of, uh, for, I, was, I was constantly struggling with that. And these memories of, of empire in the Balkan periphery, Turkey has been introduced as the new, other as a new East, let's say, but that also cohabitates strongly with a very strong Turkish presence in the environment as well. So it's again and in the history. I think Kosovo is East is West. It's Albania, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also Serbia to an extent because Serbia is seen as Russia's brethren in the Balkans as as an Oriental despotic. Uh, but very often in, in in Kosovo discourse, I see mm -hmm. that this need to e maybe even overplay Serbia's connections with Russia mm -hmm. because that will then show to the Western partners that uh, Serbia mm -hmm. belongs maybe, some of that Kosovo belongs to Europe maybe even more than Serbia. But maybe that's my you know, no, wrong that, impression. But I think in, in the mapping of these, of these meta-memories, that, that is one of the very influential, you can see it in the political discourse as such. But beyond that, there's a lot of. Uh, I think Turkey is also strongly competing with Serbia <laughs> to, to, you know, to become the East. Competition of others yeah. in Absolutely. othering. Absolutely. <laughs> Who's the best other, the most functional other? Do you want to jump in? Not so much on this at the moment now. Beyond the boat. Okay, so a, maybe. Can I ask a Paul yes. question? Paul, I, I was intrigued by your question. Because you see, you. You talk about memories of nation, and of course you assume that from liberal international position this may be problematic, yeah? But there's another way of looking at those things. There, there was always a, a traditionalist agenda and modernist agenda. And in this sense you can identify between conservative and progressive, because traditionalist agenda may of course, draw on experiences of, of, of international uh, history, like, like uh, Peter uh, the, the Great in, in, in Russia, right? So it doesn't have to, or, uh, or liberal tradition, yeah? But it assumes per definition that the world doesn't change that you can recreate two centuries old, you know, kind of spirit to apply to the future. Modernists would say to you different things. Modernists would say, okay, this is all fine, but societies and uh, uh, change because of technology, because of culture and other things. So modernists would always tell you, and this is pro progressive agenda, that you cannot just go back to history. You have to 
goes for utopia, so to speak. Yeah? You have to jump into the future because of technology opportunity in particular. Yeah? This is this. And here you can see the, the tension of different kind between progressive and, and, and traditionalist, so to speak. You see what I mean? I, I, I take that. And, and you see that in Britain, for instance, in the, in the guild tradition, it was built very much on the, on the traditions of, 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 of medieval guilds. But it was about applying new technologies to liberate men <coughs> from, the, from, from, from the state. And, and, and you see. Indeed. I think, I think Peter's point also, and I'm totally with you on that, but your point about not being able to choose I think is to some extent important. I mean, it's a very important point because things get embedded um, in, in, in a kind of collective memory. And when something gets embedded, then it takes uh, decades of, of recalibration and, and re education. And that's why the take back control struck a deep, in my view, deep chord in, in the English psyche because it touched something that's embedded in us about Britain or England being born in England, its parliament being in control, its army being in control, its scientists and explorers and so on. And the question that I wanted to ask, if I, can I just... Uh, yeah, so that I, yeah, that, no, that. okay. Uh, um, can I just take yeah, some yeah. who haven't asked questions and then no, come no, no, back no. to you and hopefully Jovelin if we have the time, and I'm also well aware that Yosa's question hasn't been addressed yet either. Uh, but we don't want to go over time too much, so normally we should end in about 10 minutes. So let me take a round of questions, if it's okay. Yeah? So Addis and then Christine. Woo, woo. Okay, you're going to have a lot of questions thrown at you. So, Addis. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's a fascinating book. I have to admit, I read the introduction to the Serbian chapter, which was um, I was also most interested in. And I just, I just uh, one one question or comment is: Where do you see the the importance or the role of, of the population at large? And I think that is a problem because if you remember Miroslav Roch, his uh, theory of how European nations come to be, and he says basically in the West, it's a three-step process. First. You have intellectuals who develop this national idea, then they spread it around, and in the West, when they spread it to the bureaucracy, that's basically it, because you control the bureaucracy, you control the state, you can form the nation. Whereas in the East, the bureaucracy is actually from the empire, so it doesn't really help you, and you see that brilliantly in Bosnia, where, where the local bureaucracy uh, in the second half of the 19th century basically fought all the reforms that were going through the Ottoman Empire because they wanted to secure there. So, so in order to spread the national idea there, you need the population. So that, that's really what distinguishes uh, the, the, the empire-based uh, nations from the others. And, and uh, when I read you, your Serbia chapter, you make, you make this point, as you did right, uh, just now, that depending on where we are in this process, different uh, memories are called upon. Uh, the Kosovo myth comes in off the Congress of Berlin and so on. And by the way, I read somewhere that, that actually the Battle of Kosovo, apart from the fact that Lazar fell, was not as decisive as we think of it today. So, so it was more a tie than actually a defeat of the Serbian army, historically. But, uh, but it, ha it, made a, of a, it became a kind of the, this, this uh, martyrdom thing through the millet system of the Ottoman Empire and stuff like that. So my question would be, um, not so much uh, how free are these... Are these uh, are these leaders to actually choose these memories and so on, but what role uh, the population at large, the fact that you have to spread this out, to, to mobilize them, plays in actually having, having to come up with these, with these uh, foreign policy concepts? Another narrow question, but hold your <laughs> breath, because we're, we're doing a tour of questions, if it's okay with you. And again, you don't have to address everything now. Christine. Thank But analogies do help me to understand things. And you began by talking about your experience being invited to dinner and not having a tie and all of that. And I wonder whether you might, could you expand on that analogy slightly? Because I understand the anxiety of that, of, of, the, you know, of, not, of your memories and not fitting in. If, you, if we're saying that you're the periphery in this analogy and Oxford is the core of the metropole. But in terms of your actual experience and at dinner, 
does it actually affect your place at the table and how that interaction goes down? Maybe it's yet to be seen. Maybe that's connected <laughs> to the instrumentalism the question, but if there's a way to kind of expand a little bit on that analogy, that might help me. Uh, let me take an, another and then... Uh, why don't we just take the full range of questions? Then we have the questions on the table. The <laughs> what? And he can ignore the ones he doesn't want exactly. to Exactly. So it's a trick in your favor. So Charles, then Jonathan, then back to Paul and Jovelin. Thank you. All I've read is just briefly going around the, the chapter in Bulgaria, which is the one I know most about, at least. And as it said, it goes through the history and the myths of Greater Bulgaria and so on. Um, and just coming, though, the, the what also goes through in the remember it was that the domestic politics as 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 independence from from the Soviets was gained um, I mean it was was accompanied by by some economic disaster repeatedly and they try as, as it says they tried first of all in the communist regime then the even cost of took it to NATO and then the the king was brought back so this is the the ultimate and none of this worked I mean to what extent I mean how much patience is there I mean, at the end of that, I mean, basically, they, they give up on the, the economic side. They've got the currency for wars, you know, really within a few years of this. Um, to what extent, you know, is, is the, the, the independence, the national myth, uh, I mean, do, does it deliver? Does it, is it, can it be sustained once there's independence and once really things are not going terribly well? Mm -hmm. I mean, and this whole form of equality. or in this country? <laughs> <laughs> the question was all, well, it, it's, all it's, it's, it's all I mean again is, is nationalism progressive or, or what's I mean you know with regard to Spain in 76 they used to say only in Spain would a Bourbon restoration be seen as progressive you know, which is anywhere else um, it's a Bulgaria question as an example of, of I mean all these companies all, I mean Soviet system collapsed and then a lot of the newly independent countries they also had a Collapse thereafter, which really must have deflated the self confidence of the people in, in, in their national myth, essentially, and, and, and therefore came to Europe. I mean, it strengthened the move towards Europe. But it's also about the price of formal equality and a fundamental tension, really, of yes. the English school, which is that at the same yes. time it's, it's a story of hierarchy and yeah. dominance. Yes. But, at the, but it's all predicated on pretending that there is formal equality for countries that become, with lots of quotes, independent. Yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, one slight regret about the book, insofar as I've had a chance to, to scan it, uh, is that with the, is the Greek chapter, which is fascinating, uh, but <coughs> it stops in 1832, and I think it would be quite interesting <laughs> to be like the others and, and, and bring it, it up to date. I 1832? Well, yeah, oh. it has yeah. a disbalance. Start with it. That's weird. Okay, I haven't yeah, read it. Yeah, which, which is a bit of a pity, uh, because uh, in particular, one of the things seems to be that these countries sort of establish themselves independently from the old other in order to join, effectively, another empire. Uh, and part of that, and here I'm speaking from the Romanian experience, is that, you know, in a way, the Romanians are really quite comfortable having somebody else give them an agenda. Um, you know, the, the, there is a tradition in Romania of the Lord from abroad who will come and sort of sort you out. And, uh, you know, I, I just wonder whether when you talk, you're talking about echoes, uh, sorry, not echoes of empire, but <laughs> moving from memories of empire, which are used to move into a different, apparently, or perceived as better. And I just wondered what sort of thoughts you had on that. And how Greece fits into that, I don't know. I wonder if there's a, you, you know, Greece was co-opted in the European, the EU empire, <laughs> Uh, to to make it to turn it into the very core of this European civilization when it had been another all this time, and I, it's kind of like a reverse or a positive Trojan horse kind of you know uh, idea and and co-opting the memories of of the periphery as it were yeah. to yeah, turn them into your own Trojan horse yeah a positive <laughs> Trojan uh, whatever <laughs> anyway, um, How much time do I have? Uh, very quickly. Paul and Jovalin, and then I want to turn back to the panel, <coughs> and then you at, la at the end. Paul. I'll try to ask it in one, in one sentence, but ignore it if it's too complicated. Peripheries tend to be 
exploited by, by the poor, by the more powerful empire countries. We did a very nice project with somebody called Robert Fox on how scientific ideas discovered all over Europe, including Greece, were often claimed by the great scientists in Paris, London, and, and parts of Germany, even though they weren't the inventors, because they had the paraphernalia and the documentation and so on. I'm just wondering whether in, in some of your questions <coughs> You can, sh you can redress, uh, when you talk about the periphery, the, maybe the, the exploitative nature of some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. sure, it's, it's too complicated a question, just to know. It's an important one because it's also a very current, present, a very present danger, as it were. Jovanin. Yes, um, I, I read a very interesting book by Noel Malcolm. Um, a recent one where he talks about the age of empire and he actually tells a fascinating story of how the periphery really is not a periphery but you were deeply integrated with the rest um, so what I, I'm, I was wondering I haven't read the book again but I was wondering what entry really means is it really uh, entry into something new or is it more a domestic contestation within these countries and how they want to it's more like a struggle for power among different Factions within these countries and, and, and competing visions of, about, about what, what their, their preferred um, uh, vision of the country is, or is it something of an entry into something else? I wonder if this is a more like a, a local story or a, a domestic politics story or a story of entering into, into, into something else, a bigger whole. Maybe that something else is entry into modernity, that all countries in the last 200 years have negotiated their entry into modernity with a lot of winners and losers and contestation. And that modernity was or was not defined by Europe or jointly or etc. Right, so I would like to turn back to the panel if you want to a concluding thought and then you'll have minus three minutes to end, <laughs> Philip. Um, well, maybe I'll say something in a way in defense of the, the book and correct me Philip, if I'm not getting it right, but Listening to a lot of the, the comments, I'm, I'm made to recall, we have to remember what, that the book is about some things and not about other things, but that those other things are very closely related to the things that the book is about. So a lot of this that we're talking about is about nation building, nationalism, mm -hmm. but the book isn't about that, although that is related to what the book is about. I mean, the book is about entry into international society. And that means a number of things, and it may require a sense of, of national identity, or it may work from a sense of national identity, but it, it isn't synonymous with it. And so a lot of the problems that we're talking about, I think, are actually not problems that, fortunately, Philip has to address, so the book has to... He shouldn't uh, burn his book. As well. Yeah, you definitely shouldn't burn your book. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, that's what uh, you know, came to mind. And I, and I had the same tendency, actually, as I was reading the, the bits that I was reading. And I, in a way, as I said, had to remind myself that um, um, it's not about some of these other things related and interesting that they, that they may be. So... For this sobering Thank remark, you. thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. I just second what. Uh, <laughs> Whatever it is. Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> agree with you. I absolutely agree. And I couldn't put it so nicely as you did. See how harmonious our colleagueship is in Oxford. <laughs> okay. Joshua, I hope you disagree because, or else we'll have a very consensual panel. Well, I still have a pending question. There. You so have a pending if question. I, if I, yeah, if I should take more time to conclude the thought, all I will say is that the book will be at the VUB, at least at the VUB, sorry, it will be advertised also for the uh, EU external relations course since it closely relates to the subjects where I teach. So much obliged. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Another set of um, super fascinating questions. Thank you for grilling me uh, properly here. This is why I came here. I expected this, and um, mm -hmm. thank you for that. So many questions. We don't have the time maybe to respond them all. I will just pick up um, two, three, and then uh, maybe we can continue our discussions later on. The first was the question asked by Vyosa at the beginning, 
and she she said uh, rightly that uh, many of the accounts um, in the chapters or some and I think I would think I would even say most of the accounts present um, the historical memories as uh, as a continuous or homogeneous I don't know what what uh, holistic, holistic yeah. with the word yeah. uninterrupted affair and um, it is totally I mean a good comment and the right thing to say but again. Uh, I think this is a deed and an effect of the work of nation builders. It is them who try to portray histories of these states as um, continuous, uninterrupted, and uh, even trans-historic affair that, for instance, the Serbian or Bulgarian or Greek nation builders, they presented their histories as, as a, as a trans-historic, as if it was a linear line which connected the ancient Greece to uh, the modern era. Maybe it was connect disconnected uh, um, historically, but um, emotionally uh, and uh, politically, it was part of the same kind of narrative, which was uninterrupted. But that's where myth comes in. Yeah, that, where, where yeah, the myth, that continuity the myth is helps the, to, the myth, yes. The myth helps to mm -hmm. stitch the two or three or five into one linear story. So... Um, again, it was not us who uh, kind of uh, maybe... Uh, presented those stories as, as a sedimented social fact, uninterrupted affair, but it was the nation builders who did it. And uh, in some cases they did it uh, more successfully, in some cases they, they, they did it less successfully, and it was always contested domestically. Um, contrary to, for instance, David Campbell, who in his earlier book, um, Writing Security, only writes about one dominant narrative and doesn't take into account uh, the contestations, which he um, changes in his latter book on Bosnia. Um, in our book, we show that these um, memories were deeply contested domestically, and we try to engage, to show, to showcase those debates between modernists and, uh, and conservatives, between uh, uh, pro-Europeans or pro-Russians, and we show that uh, this was not... Um, um, such an easy task to achieve. They, they faced resistance and they faced contestations and they changed their stories along the way. So um, we didn't take the role of populations and we didn't uh, go that, um, that far. I think that definitely something that sh should be done. But on the other hand, I wonder how uh, important were populations when foreign and security policy is concerned uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. None of these countries, or uh, throughout the 19th centuries, I mean, the, the, even today, foreign policy uh, is uh, an affair of the elites, although with, after Brexit, uh, I'm not sure if that can be um, said any longer. But still, I mean, um, wider public is not so involved in the... At, le at least it wasn't definitely in peasant societies and undemocratic uh, polities uh, of uh, Central and Southeastern Europe uh, throughout the 19th century. And the core of our analysis is basically focusing on this period, not so much on the you know, post-Second World War uh, or even post-Cold War era when uh, democratization kicked in and um, you know, foreign security policy and collective memories had to be uh, much more synchronized with some po kind of public opinion and popular views. So yes, I agree that that's definitely a weakness uh, or uh, something that we didn't look at. But uh, I, yeah, I simply have a reservation to what extent that would be analytically useful for the early 19 and uh, later on the 19th century uh, that we look in. Um, Anecdotes. Uh, you asked me to expand on, uh, on my anecdote, and uh, I uh, learned another lesson that anecdotes are not entirely benign, that they can bite back, and they did in this case. But, but what I wanted to basically say that, uh, I mean, it's, it was a very uh, rudimentary analogy that um, countries at the periphery of the European state system had certain... Uh, understand expectations of um, the international society and that those expectations were based on their own collective memories of bygone empires. And in certain cases, those expectations uh, helped them 
uh, kind of navigate this uh, path and socialize uh, smoothly with the international society. And in some cases, they distorted their expectations and uh, bring them troubles. Uh, in my case here, I expected that I will go to the dinner without the tie, which was, which is something that we do in at the periphery of Europe. But here, at the core, at the very center of the academic. Uh, establishment, people go to dinner with, with the ties, and uh, um, you know, my expectation was um, obviously wrong. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to expand more on that uh, because <laughs> I might run into a new trouble. Uh, with that, I think... <laughs> well, it's in a way a good place to end, although I know <laughs> that you have many more questions to address, but this simply shows First of all, that the book opens up as many questions as it addresses, and many more. Um, it also demonstrates that we will want to discuss it in our class, and I want to echo Vyosha, and I'm sure Jan and Richard will back me on this, that we will put the book on our reading list, because it will be very inspiring for our students, especially because we are very keen on promoting the critique of the uh, English school in this place. Um, and, and, and indeed, I would like to thank you for bringing the book you know, very much around our table, which may, not, which may be pretending these days to be at the center of the world. Whether we, pre we speak of Oxford or Britain or Empire 2.2, Paul, you know, let's all uh, just simply rejoice in a world that indeed, thankfully, has increasingly many, many centers. So I wonder how we can continue to speak about this expansion of ours. I think and I hope that we're conveying to all our students, yours and yours and all of ours, that indeed we need to decenter uh, and to understand how you decenter, you also first have to critique how centering has happened in the first place historically. So for bringing all of these provocative thoughts and ideas to our table, uh, Philip, uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking. Thank you. As well as, you. as well as our three panelists who wonderfully took on the challenge. Thank you. Right.